Hi there, and welcome to this very short presentation I've put together on an elective module that I deliver in year four, semester eight, of both the social care and early childhood care programs. Um, historically, my module was known as the Futures of Welfare module, uh, but there is a name change looming, and uh, in the future, ironically, it'll be known as Futures of Care and Society. Richardson has said that uh, when it comes to the future, there are three kinds of people. Those who let it happen, those who make it happen, and those who wonder what happened. Now, I'm sure uh, every one of us uh, looking at those particular words uh, can relate to at least one of those type of people. Uh, I've certainly let it happen. Um, I have tried to make it happen. And uh, occasionally I've wondered what the hell has happened. Uh, in my life, so I think um, they're not mutually uh, exclusive uh, conditions. However, the big thing here, um, I believe, is that Richardson suggests that we basically need to take more interest in our futures, um, and there's a whole series of reasons why that might be the case. But if we look at um, your own particular career needs as either social care practitioners or early childhood care practitioners, since you've started your studies at IT Sligo, you're aware of the bewildering changes that have occurred um, in terms of technology, in terms of medicine. Um, if you even look at your own learning experience when you arrived here in first year, uh, we probably weren't even using Turnitin. Very few members of staff were probably using Moodle. Uh, you mightn't have been using Google Drive. I mean, there's been so many rapid changes. You can imagine that within your own uh, future career as an early childhood care practitioner or as a social care practitioner, you are going to be constantly grappling with profound and uh, rapid change. Now, this module, in my opinion, goes a long way towards preparing you for those changes. It's future-proofing you, if you will, and future-proofing the ways in which you go about imagining and thinking about the care that you're providing to your clients. Um, this is quite a horrendous image, isn't it? This is obviously the very famous uh, photograph, and it's not uh, in any way doctored. Um, this is a laboratory mouse with a human ear growing from its back, the result of um, genetic manipulation, where a human, the, the gene that produced the human ear was implanted into the gene, DNA uh, structure of a mouse. And I guess this image, more than most, it can be quite horrific, but it can also uh, conjure up uh, ideas of um, incredible, unimaginable uh, future possibilities and scenarios for the human condition. Now, if we click on this particular um, image, we'll be brought to a link where there's a short um, video, which we'll watch, um, about the genetic modification of uh, milk producing cows in China. So if you bear with me for a moment or two, we'll have a look at this and then we'll move on to the next one. Humans have been drinking it for millennia. Wholesome, healthy, full cream milk. But this dairy in Beijing isn't quite what it seems. These cows have all been genetically modified. And this is human breast milk. The Chinese scientist responsible successfully inserted the human breast milk gene into a cow embryo and then implanted it into a surrogate. The result is a transgenic herd of 300 and milk the scientists claim is healthier than the bovine variety. The human breast milk produced by the cows is antibacterial and helps boost the immune system. With government approval, it could be on supermarket shelves within three years. You may find the idea hard to swallow, but these dairy workers disagree. <laughs> they say it's stronger and sweeter than cow's milk. It's a world first in a country that's leading the stampede to embrace genetically modified food. The scientists who created this herd have also produced animals that are resistant to mad cow disease, as well as beef cattle that are genetically modified for more nutritious meat. 
Critics say the risks of transgenic food aren't yet fully understood. But while the West worries about the dangers and morality of genetic modification, China says those scruples are misplaced. There are one and a half billion people in the world who don't have enough to eat. It's our duty to develop science and technology, not to hold it back. We need to feed people first before we consider ideals and convictions. China's pushing the boundaries of genetic modification seemingly unperturbed by any ethical concerns. Holly Williams, Sky News, Beijing. Well, quite an interesting phenomenon. Um, the series of issues that that particular short clip raises in terms of ethics, uh, in terms of animal rights, for instance, um, in terms of uh, human rights um, to actually transpose a human uh, milk, breast milk producing gene into a herd of cattle uh, does raise profound issues. Uh, other images that reflect the future of these uh, cyborgs, part human, part machine. Of course, increasingly, uh, as we'll see um, on the module, uh, we are moving towards what is known as a singularity moment. Um, and that is a moment um, where a number of scientists at the Singularity uh, University um, in the United States of America believe will take place around 2035 when humans and um, machines and computers will merge. Um, we also see that enormous uh, information is currently uh, developed to actually insert robots. These are known as nano robots, uh, microscopically small uh, robots into our bloodstream. One example, for instance, would be to actually um, clear people of their cholesterol or to use them uh, as an alternative to uh, what can be very uncomfortable and unpleasant experience of dialysis for people with uh, kidney failure. Um, <laughs> there are even moments and movements towards uh, constructing a, a robotic sex industry um, and that would give rise to a whole series of interesting examples of new discussions around the ethics and morality of humans having sex with machines, for instance. Um, technology is also allowing us to uh, provide a detailed uh, highlighting of um, you know, the big uh, illnesses that may affect the planet. So, for instance, in 2008, you see the, the date here, 20th of February 2008, um, the BBC carried the headline, Map Pinpoints Disease Hotspots. And if you have a look there, South West Africa uh, were seen as areas with the highest probability of major communicable diseases. And sadly, look what's happened in terms of the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, uh, Guinea and Liberia. Um, and yet, if you think about it six years ago, uh, scientists believed that this was going to be a distinct possibility in this region. That would you raise the question: Why hasn't, or why wasn't anything done to prevent the outbreak? Another example here of technology increasingly is the, uh, I suppose, the assumption now. It's not even a kind of a science fiction type promise that there will be robotic provision of care in the future. And if I click on this. Not an unusual sight in today's world, elderly people dependent on walking aids. It's already the case today that one in five Germans is a senior citizen and has reached the age at which, for the first time in their lives, they may require assistance devices to carry out everyday tasks. To enable citizens to cope with the challenge of growing restrictions in their mobility and to allow them to lead independent lives in their accustomed surroundings for as long as possible, Fraunhofer IPA has spent over 10 years developing the CareRobot service robot. As a product vision, CareRobot is designed to demonstrate how a robot can be used to provide everyday assistance around the home. The assistance provided might look something like this. 
From the comfort of our armchair, with just a few touches of the display, the user can instruct the robot to bring her something to drink. Kerobot is programmed to know just where the different items of food and drink are kept in the user's home. Sensors enable it to detect the position of the required drink on the kitchen counter. It can then grasp the bottle with its robotic arm. Using its tray back in the living room, Carobot safely and intuitively serves the drink the lady has ordered. Family members too can use the services of the robot to assist their relative. This allows them to check that all is well even in cases where, say, the elderly person lives in a different part of town. For this purpose, they can remotely control Carobot and use the robot's cameras to take a look around their loved one's home. I got the photo, thank you. I've already set it up. Oh, now I can see it on the closet. It looks great. The robot can independently plan and execute a wide range of different fetch and carry tasks to order. Sometimes, however, it too comes up against the limits of its abilities. For example, if objects are arranged too close together or if the lighting is poor. In such cases, another solution is to hand. If Carobot is unable to unambiguously identify or grip an object with the user's permission, it has the option of getting in contact with a service center. From there, a member of staff can remotely command the robot to execute an appropriate arm motion to enable it to complete its task. Yet, Carobot can do much more than just fetch and carry things. In addition to providing general assistance with everyday tasks, such as making appointments with doctors or tradesmen, with the robot's help, the service center can offer a comprehensive range of functions. For instance, the robot can not only go and fetch a blood pressure monitor at the required times, but if necessary, it can also explain how to use the device correctly. The robot sends the readings directly to the service center where the data is stored. Any critical developments are identified immediately and the required response is initiated. One of the main reasons why people with impaired mobility are no longer able to live alone in their own home is fear of falling and the related consequences. This risk can be addressed by the installation of a fall detector, which sends an alert in case of an emergency, allowing assistance to be promptly provided. In that case, Carobot makes its way automatically to the place where the fall has occurred. At the same time, the service center becomes involved. Trained members of staff are able to use the robot's cameras to make an initial assessment of the situation and to talk to the person who has just fallen. If necessary, they can immediately call an emergency service and also provide the necessary patient information, such as recent blood pressure measurements or information on any allergies. While waiting for the emergency service to arrive, staff at the service center can act to calm the person who has just fallen. Alternatively, they can instruct the robot to fetch the person a drink or a pillow until help finally arrives. So what an absolutely fascinating video on the extent to which these rudimentary robots in Germany uh, seem to be providing, you know, an interesting entry level of care. Um, similarly, uh, because of demographic pressures, uh, declining population in Japan, uh, the Japanese um, are generating and developing very advanced care robots, uh, particularly for dealing with older people and uh, increasingly in kindergarten care as well, where robots are beginning to predominate uh, in the provision of care. So these things are all quite fascinating. And I'm sure there are issues that you're all interested in finding out more about. Um, you know, in a very interesting way, I would argue that uh, in terms of the future careers, it's quite likely that uh, a number of you are going to end up as um, assistive care uh, technology managers. Uh, by that I mean along the lines of the um, 
the support staff back at the base in that uh, video from Germany um, monitoring care of uh, older people or dependent people remotely and you would still need to have undertaken uh, social care, early childhood care um, degree learning program but this will increasingly be augmented uh, by um, an awareness and understanding and knowledge of technology. Now, um, the module is designed to um, equip you to do it uh, a rapidly changing world and to do that I've produced a um, module booklet. Uh, it's quite comprehensive. It's basically the A to Z of everything you need to know and how to survive the module uh, in terms of uh, communications with me and yourselves, um, extensive readings, resources, uh, relevant websites, etc. Uh, information about the assessment strategy. Um, and it's got a lecture series, as you can see, it's a, a pretty broad lecture series um, where we're looking at uh, introducing to the study of futures and forecasting, looking at methodological issues, very, very important. And you can see the rest of the topics there, quite broad. Um, sometimes we vary the topics. But, you know, last year we looked at the future of food, um, increasingly a very complex and politically charged one. We looked at uh, privatizing um, the welfare state and benefits and our healthcare system in many ways. Um, looking at genetics, you know, um, what are the limits to genetic um, engineering and manipulation of our genes and, you know, what sort of... Uh, species of humans will exist in 200 years uh, will it be recognizable from ourselves today uh, the features of education is quite profound isn't it um, myself Breda McTigard and um, Thompson Caballero are as you know working on what's called the little project where we're exploring the um, growing significance and impact of technology on the lives of um, early years learners and the so-called digital natives um, and you, know, you won't be at all surprised to learn that there is a complete policy vacuum in Ireland and in other European countries as well, it must be admitted, um, facilitating this. I mean, some children as young as uh, three, four, five years of age now can actually program. Never mind use smartphones and smart apps. They can actually program, develop their own, write their own programs. It's quite astonishing. We look at the future of the family. Um, we look at the future of identity. You know, how are all these technologies and developments uh, impacting on us? Um, what sort of a society? I mean, how can we imagine the future of care uh, if it is uh, roboticized? Does that mean it's depersonalized? I already mentioned the issue of you know, the sex industry increasingly becoming more robotic. You know, what, what sort of a future does that entail for people? So it is a quite a um, challenging and very uh, stretching type module so if you really want to expand your horizons and become aware of uh, new terrain new, new information new philosophies um, then this is the module for you uh, the assessment strategy is composed of um, two components uh, a part A and a part B uh, part A is what we call a feasibility pitch it's worth 40% of the marks uh, where you are uh, as a member of a couple, two of you, or as a group, no more than three, um, make a pitch. Basically, you sell an idea, and that can be as broad as you like. It can be from looking at the future of the environment, of water, of land, of food production, uh, of energy needs, to the future of disability, the future of children, the future of uh, care, for instance. Um, it's just an enormous space that you can actually develop your um, assignment on and we'll negotiate with you on that. Um, then you have an end of semester project. It's basically the write-up of your feasibility pitch. And if you're doing it on your own, it's worth a maximum of 4,000 words. Um, it's 60% of the overall grade. If you're doing it as a couple or as a group, then we negotiate, obviously, a larger word count. Uh, but in the past, students have found these uh, to be very rewarding and very challenging and very exciting um, because I introduce you to um, the whole area of uh, scenario writing. That's part of the uh, lecture I give you on uh, futures and forecasting methodologies. The scenario, as you know, uh, as you may know, is a, a very powerful tool to express a number of visions of the future that you may have. 
you wouldn't expect me not to have a Moodle page and I certainly have one for you on this module as well and um, it's updated daily it's uh, replete with uh, uh, relevant links some of my previous lectures I've put up there not just the PowerPoints but recordings of them um, I also facilitate students to make their feasibility pitches online so they get used to new technologies yourselves as e-learners. So we talk about this, but I'd like you to demonstrate it and actually to live it yourselves. Um, there are a number of folders on the Moodle website um, that are absolutely jam-packed with uh, journal articles and reports that I think will be of relevance to you and your learning and in particular in terms of the uh, development of your assignments. Uh, I also have a dedicated uh, Twitter feed uh, for the module which I'd like you all to sign up to. It's, it's called at Futures of Welfare and uh, it keeps us abreast of all the breaking news globally from the top experts in the field of future studies right across the planet. So it's a, a must have a must visit facility. I hope that you found this uh, brief introduction to the module um, insightful, informative and interesting and I hope it's whetted your appetite to want to uh, commit yourself.